Now, by now, I'm sure most of you are aware of, if not quite familiar with, what's often described as a BME attainment gap. Here's what that gap looks like uh, nas uh, nationally in a degree, the degree category history and philosophical studies, which includes history, philosophy, theology, heritage studies, and archaeology. Now, if we look at this data as it's often presented, a comparison of attainment for good honors, so a 2 1 or a first, or and a first, the disparity is present, but it's not. Um, it's not that, that, that great. All right, so you see BME on the left-hand mm -hmm. side, and watch on the right. So here's another presentation of the same data, this time broken down uh, between a first and a two one. Mm -hmm. So here we see that BME students are approximately 8.1% less likely to achieve a first as a white student. Um, I don't have the data that breaks down this information uh, by each category. However, I know based on my own uh, institution that this disparity is really between, in terms of UK students, so home students, uh, that this disparity is really between um, black African and black Caribbean or black other students, those students who identify in that way, and white students, as well as students who identify as Asian. And if you break down that Asian category, usually it's Bangladeshi and Pakistani as well, specific, very specific communities where this kind of disparity is present. So although we talk about BME attainment, really it is very specific communities. So what this tells us is that BME students are significantly less likely to obtain a first. And considering the ever more competitive process of obtaining and funding for graduate school, um, the likelihood of receiving funding without a first, this gap has incredible implications for history as a discipline. Um, following on from what Melissa just said, um, the disparity in attainment has been attributed to many things, most commonly student cultural def deficit, which we know is rubbish and now widely accepted as such. Students are entering the university with the same tariff, but graduating with lower marks. Whatever mm. is happening is definitely happening in the institution. And this is not an easy pill to swallow for many in a liberal university. To do so would require faculty to admit their complicity in the unequal outcomes of students. And so we see resistance to this notion. The denial that the attainment gap is happening in our institution or in our departments. One of the things that we did at Warwick to challenge this is to look at our own data at the department level and speak to history students. The quantitative data on student attainment and progression paints the same picture we see nationally with very little difference, as does the anecdotal data gathered by student surveys and the focus group. The report we did and other reports done on the issue have pointed to several deeply ingrained interrelated issues. Um, these include feelings of distance from what many have described as a Eurocentric curriculum, um, particularly not being able to see oneself represented in that curriculum, discriminatory marking practices, um, students especially know, especially when they try and speak back to the canon or write outside of the module. Regular experiences of microaggressions and racism in and outside of the classroom. And when, when students do report this racism, there tends to be a lack of institutional response, which has fostered a lack of trust in these reporting mechanisms. And this means that many incidences on, of racism do go unreported. Um, a lack of faculty that they can relate to in particular the lack of faculty of colour, leaves many students feeling especially isolated. And this is compounded by the fact that for many students of colour, they are, they are the minority within the student body. And imposter syndrome, which is exacerbated by the fact that students of colour are often in majority white spaces. And the lack of faculty and students of colour leaves many of them feeling like they do not belong in the institution. Mm -hmm as well as alienation from the institution. This, leaves, this includes feeling invisible to lecturers and feeling like they're excluded from classroom debates and discussions. Mental health, which many students in general suffer from whilst at university. But for students of colour, this is exacerbated by those very feelings of isolation, brought, brought on by the fact that there is a lack of representation within the institution. Often students of colour feel like they have no one to speak to within the university and that mental health services do not provide them with specialised support. Um, what strikes me is that there is one common thread throughout all of this. Students of colour are made to feel like they don't belong in the institution. 
Right, okay, so despite the range of issues that um, students have identified, and there are, uh, you know, this really long range, and it's not just at Warwick, uh, some of the other national reports have pointed to the same kinds of issues. Um, what seems to have been picked up most commonly by academics and by the institution has been this focus on the content of the curriculum, um, and this sort of, and claims at least, to decolonize the curriculum. Uh, so Roads Must Fall in South Africa, the organizing of students in South Africa color at Oxford, Why Is My Curriculum White at UCL, for example, um, being the inspiration for much of this, right, and that language of decolonizing the curriculum. And there are some really good examples of academics actually engaging the politics at the heart of these movements. However, for the most part, what decolonizing the curriculum has come to mean, at least in history and at least at an institutional level, um, has been diversifying the curriculum tagging on of black or brown authors in the reading list, uh, sometimes as core text, but mostly not, uh, the introduction of modules ostensibly about black or brown experiences, but then that recenter whiteness, uh, or like Oxford has done most recently, making it compulsory for history students to take at least one, and this is quote, non-British or European module, which apparently translates to black or Asian history. Now, Sue will say more about this in a moment, but I just want to be clear that we're not saying that these efforts should be completely abandoned. However, um, our grown concern is that decolonizing the curriculum, at least the way it's been appropriated, has become this buzz in academia, divested from the social justice elements at its original core, and a means to an end. It's a way of checking a box. And so that some efforts to decolonize the curriculum actually ends with an adjustment in the content, a diversifying of the curriculum, but not an actual change to the pedagogy, or the institutional culture, practice, or processes that make the university a space where these inequalities exist and are perpetuated. So a truly decolonized curriculum is not just what is taught. This is only part of the issue. It's also about how it's taught, by whom, and to what purpose. And I'm focused on teaching. We're talking here about teaching today. But I, I think we can also see this, and this is also applicable in the research. So which projects get funded, and who gets funded, and so on and so forth. So, to follow on from that. So the question really should be not merely whether there is visibility, but the kind of visibility within our curriculum. Too often, efforts to decolonize the curriculum, recolonize, and center whiteness. So much of the teaching of, his of the global south is taught in relation to empire. And while, the history of, while black history has become synonymous with black pain, I remember one focus group participant remarked that they were sad to see three final year modules on slavery. They asked something along the lines of, what does this say about black people? This is especially uncomfortable when you consider that this history is taught by a white ac academic in a majority white space, and you and probably one other student are the only ones in the room who are impacted by the legacies of that history. It strikes me that the classroom isn't designed for students of color. When the classroom becomes a space which only re reiterates your victimhood, it ceases to be a nurturing learning space. Intersectionality has also become a buzzword of late. So often gender is taught as white, race is male, and the queer subject of color is invisible. In quite tokenistic ways, race, women, queerness tend to be tagged onto a module in standalone weeks. It's not enough to merely highlight historiographical silences, rather an intersectional analysis should be incorporated throughout. We should be reflective about our scholarly practices. Often the history of Western epistemology, secondary and primary sources, are taught without or very little consideration for the context of empire. Rather, students should be made aware of not only how the legacies of empire impact their own work, but their complicity in the dominance of Western knowledge production. All right, so as Sue's touched on then, we also need to consider the by whom and for what purpose. And it strikes me that it's much easier, it's been much easier for, the inst for institutions to address the content of modules than to address uh, the many other issues that students of color have been raising, um, including the quite striking absence of staff of color in permanent posts in uh, departments, history departments across this country. And if there's any doubt about the percentages of BME uh, staff in history departments in the UK, I did this, I compiled the data. This is the ECU's most recent report, 2017. This is, um, oh, hold on, sorry. Okay. <laughs> that other one was just, that, that shocked me too. <laughs> <There's like> too <laughs> many. Um, so this is the breakdown of 
uh, staff in the UK. These are both. This is both uh, UK staff, so British-born um, mm -hmm. staff and non-British-born staff of colour, um, uh, and white staff, both uh, British and non-British white staff. So 6.1% um, of staff in this country, in the history departments employed in this country, are of colour. Um, And that's this broken down. I've put the stats there, so you can see. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and I recognize these categories. These are the categories that the ECU has used. And they're, I mean, they in themselves are problematic for a lot of different reasons. But just to give a sense, then, of how people, at least based on how people have identified uh, what the breakdown is. Mm. All right, so. so it's not just a matter of representation, right? It's not just that there's a lack of black and brown bodies in higher education, but it's also perhaps more importantly about black and brown perspectives and voices. And while some have recognized this, the response is often um, to perhaps invite an academic of color to give a talk. I don't, know, I don't know about you, Jonathan, but the amount of times I've been asked <laughs> to give talks at other institutions for free as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's definitely a recognition that that, that you know, uh, BME voices are valuable, but not any value post, uh, placed on that in terms of employment opportunities, right, or, or monetary value in any sort of way. Um, and so what is happening is that those actually employed and paid to research and teach this so-called decolonized history, the histories of black, brown, and colonized folk, histories that are being included as a part of this effort to decolonize and de uh, diversify the curriculum and held up as a marker of the institution's willingness to change, right, which allows the institution to get you know, certain mm -hmm. credit, like the race equality charter mark, for instance, mm -hmm. um, are not those directly impacted by the discrimination and inequalities present in the institution in itself. Instead, it seems those most likely to benefit from the critique and challenges to the Eurocentric institution are not communities of color, but those who have always benefited from the institution. And this is a quote by William Ake, who wrote a 2014 article in The Conversation, a wonderful article. He writes that black communities still experience exclusion, underrepresentation, and marginalization when it comes to the UK's major institutions. While academics benefit from research income and a raised profile because of their knowledge of black communities, the communities themselves remain on the margins of academic life. So I want to say again that what we're saying here um, is nothing new. We're not claiming originality, right? This is basically the sum of conversations I feel like I've been having since I entered this country seven and a half years ago, uh, predominantly with black academics. Um, and you know, black academics have been writing about this as well. So, uh, and UK-based black academics. So William Ake, for instance, Lisa Palmer, Nadina Doherty, uh, Olivet Attal, Deborah Gabriel, Nathaniel Tobias Coleman, Rod B. Shilliam, Shirley Ann Tate, Angelina Jolie, or Angelina Osborne, sorry, um, Hakim Adi, Candy Andrews. I can go on and on, right? Um, so this is a conversation that is happening, that is there, it's present. However, it just feels like um, this is conversation that is that is only happening within black or BME academic communities. And that is not a, a conversation that um, very many of our white colleagues, although there are some uh, who are engaging with this conversation, but certainly not the institution itself is willing to engage in. And what's troubling about this is that it's not just our responsibility, right? This is not our, just our fault. It's not our fault that there's an attainment gap, right? Um, and so really, this should be the responsibility of all of us. So just to reiterate our earlier points, diversifying a, diversifying a curriculum will not only liberate, will not liberate it or the institution, it's not enough. It will certainly not address the disparity that has been a motivation for this move in the first place. If we are truly committed to addressing racism in power in our, use, in our institutions, we have to move beyond representation or diversity to the adoption of a social justice oriented anti-racist pedagogy and practice anti-racism in the way we teach, research, and operate in the university. Decolonizing has to be more than diversifying in order to create real, long-lasting institutional change. Thank you very much. It's a message everyone needs to hear, and I look forward to an interesting discussion 
of it. Um, we'll move straight on and we'll have the panel at discussion at the end. So, Jonathan, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Pam. Um, I'm going to be a bit more sort of reflective about my teaching practice and experiences teaching uh, at Leeds and elsewhere. Um, and I think it'll give a bit of uh, echoes a lot of what we've what we've just heard. And then I'm going to reflect a little bit on some of the early results from the Royal Historical Society's Race, Ethnicity and Equality survey, which has gone round, and I hope many of you will have filled. It closed recently, and I've, I've been able to see some of the responses to that. So that's, that's what I'm going to talk about for about uh, 10 minutes or so, probably less, right? Um, so at the end of last year, uh, Nigel Bigger, uh, Oxford theologian, uh, had his project announced to the public, uh, looking at ethics and empire, in which he was envisioning doing a sort of cost-benefit analysis of empire. You could weigh up the Amritsar massacre against uh, the, uh, the, the having the, the, the abolition of the slave trade, and you could come out with some moral judgment on whether the empire was, it was a good thing or a bad thing. And as a result of this, imperial historians on Twitter went berserk, really. Um, and laid into it for a variety of social media and, and old media uh, outlets. Fortunately, I was away from the university during this, this whole <laughs> thing, but on, on returning to it, a number of things struck me. Not only the cogency of the arguments against Bigger's project and how well it had galvanised this community of scholars who previously had seen divisions amongst themselves, but some more pernicious elements of how Bigger was framing his project in his defences of it, he refers to it often as our empire and our guilt. And it was that identification that I thought was interesting and wanted to, to pick apart a little bit, not least because it seemed familiar to me not only from Bigger's quite overt colonial apology, but from my experiences of teaching in mostly white, in fact, almost entirely white classrooms. And here I would find students would often say things like we when they were talking about the British Raj or refer to Indians uh, in, under the terms of, of native quite a lot as a, as a noun rather than as a, an adjective. And having to have those conversations with them about, well, who are you speaking for? Why are you speaking? Or trying to claim, seeming to claim some identification with an empire and with the empire. The only times where I've had this successfully unpacked or really opened up in a productive way was in teaching on a MA in Race and Resistance where the classroom has been predominantly non-white. And it's the only time that I've had this experience. And in that classroom, I teach a, a, a class on race in, in teaching in higher education. And there's an article which comes out of the US circumstances called, the you know, US context called Getting Slammed, written by a woman called Robin D'Angelo. And what that research behind that article is, is looking at a small group of trainee teachers who are discussing race and critically discussing race overtly in a seminar. And what she found was that the white students would often use the rhetoric of safe spaces to represent the interventions of historians of color as being violent in some way. Yeah. Hence the title, Getting Slammed. Mm. Mm. It's a very interesting article. I recommend going to read it. But what I found teaching this article was it, it opened up the non-white students to to completely say that they, they recognized a lot of the descriptions in there. They recognized the awkwardness that was there in the descriptions of how a seminar worked. Mm. And they recognized being hyper aware of their race in discussions of empire, of discussions of, of history more generally. The white students, however, felt that it was the first time that their race had ever been made obvious to them, made something that wasn't just a background, in a sense. And I set this alongside some readings on, on the phenomenology of whiteness by, by, by Sarah Ahmed. So they have some 
apparatus to articulate this thing, this, these feelings already. But it, it really does it helps expose the extent to which, even when we've been discussing race in a classroom explicitly, white students haven't thought of themselves as raced bodies mm. in the classroom. Mm. Now, some of this stuff has become particularly, uh, I've become particularly aware of it as I hear stories from other colleagues who, white colleagues particularly, who hear um, students saying things that either border on racism or uh, are pro-imperial. And me never having had that experience in a classroom. And I'm reflecting on that yeah. and thinking about the presence of my own body in the classroom, stifling, shaping conversations which, which are held. Mm -hmm. Things which people will say, which things students won't say, or at least in the space of a seminar room. And what is, this has got me to, to think about more extensively is a debate that is sometimes played out in equality committees and in the various task and finish groups set in universities as a result of Why Is My Curriculum White campaign, which, which went across the universities, which is between decolonizing the curriculum as a pedagogic um, revolution, as some people may see it, an attempt to try and to open up and diversify the curriculum to an extent, but also to try and change methodologies, to try and change the types of sources which historians use um, on one side, and a attempt to try and diversify the student body and the academic body on the other. And sometimes these things are pitted against each other. I, I've, I've heard people who argue for decolonizing the curriculum argue against just diversifying the, the, the makeup of the body on the grounds that that doesn't actually necessarily change anything if people are still learning the same processes. I think what my experiences, my reflections tell me though is that the two cannot be done without one another. That without the diversity of bodies in a classroom or the experience of different uh, backgrounds coming into the classroom, truly decolonizing a curriculum isn't going to be very successful, I don't think. Okay, and that full reflection, that full change that's required isn't something that's going to happen um, just in changing our, our methods and our reading lists. I think we need to genuinely engage in the, the, what our student body looks like, what our staff bodies look like. So in the last sort of few minutes that I've got, I wanted to reflect on just how far we've got to go in this. So the survey, the Royal Historical Society survey closed, I think it was last week. It had over 700 responses. We were very pleased with that. One of the concerns we had was that uh, it, it wouldn't be as well received or as actively engaged with as the uh, gender equality report. It seems that it has been. Now I've had a cursory look at some of the responses to, to those questions. And I, I'm, we're still drafting the report, so I don't want to say anything that's going to uh, colour how that report will be received, but it was um, eye-opening in two ways. It was eye-opening in the term, types of experiences that staff, both white staff and uh, BME staff were, were reporting. Lots of instances of uh, experiencing casual racism from their colleagues, lots of instances of experiencing casual racism, overt racism in some respects, in some terms, uh, from their students. A, uh, a quite widespread lack of awareness of equalities legislation and uh, a lack of training on those things. And I, I think uh, it's, it's worth saying a, um, a clear sense of isolation from, from staff, really noticeable, powerful sense of isolation from staff. On the other side, the other second thing which I found dishearteningly surprising actually was the extent of people's hostility to the uh, survey itself. Now, it wasn't a large number of these things. I haven't, as I said, the survey hadn't closed at this point, but there were responses which were on the one hand saying that the survey was one of the most pernicious forms of 
identity politics that was attacking the discipline, and others more subtly referring to the problems that they had coming into the, they meaning non-white staff, had in becoming historians and what they needed to do in order to come into the discipline. A, a, a sort of referent which I found jarring as I read it because I realized that I was they. Mm. So thinking about all of the issues which have been raised already coming out of some of the research and work, but also looking at across the, the discipline in terms of statistics, but also thinking about my own practices and looking at other people's experiences, um, I think there's concerted effort that needs to be made. And frankly, there's, there's not enough BME staff to make, a, to make the impact in across the sector of it, that the expectation of labor that is being put Mm. on BME staff mm. is uh, is capable of doing so i'm going to i'm going to mm. end there well, thanks very much <laughs> thanks very much Jonathan um Miranda thank you and thank you for having me um right um i uh I suppose I, I, um, I'm coming at this from as more of being um, a student of black British history. Um, my, uh, I did my doctorate at Oxford finishing in 2011. The subject was Africans in Britain, 1500 to 1640. I found evidence of over 360 individuals of African origin living in England and Scotland in that period. Um, I asked questions of how they got here, what they did when they got here, what kind of employment they did, who they married, what their religious experience was like, uh, and crucially, perhaps, uh, what was their status under the law. Uh, and I found that they were not enslaved. There was no law of slavery in England at this time. This is before the English really embark on the projects of slave trading and empire. And in this period, um, we find... Um, African, some Africans leaving independent lives, financially independent lives. There's a silk weaver, there's a needle maker. These are in London in the Elizabethan period. Um, you know, there's a lot, a lot of different things going on. And I wanted to bring my findings to a wider audience. So after some efforts uh, getting a publisher, I um, published uh, last October my book, Black Tudors, The Untold Story. Uh, and in the book, I chose 10 individuals who I was able to piece their lives together in more detail because, um, unfortunately, a lot of the Africans I found, we only have sort of one line in a parish register saying something like, John, a blackamoor, was buried, and you can't really um, find out much more about them that way. But luckily, some of them appear in court as witnesses. You get a bit more then. Some of them appear in voyage accounts. Some of them appear in... Uh, in, well, there's an extensive parish clerk memorandums book from St. Bottles Allgate, which is, was a very useful source. Uh, so um, my 10 black Tudors were um, John Blank, the trumpeter to Henry VII and Henry VIII, uh, Jacques Francis, the salvage diver who worked on the wreck of the Mary Rose, Diego, the circumnavigator who sailed round the world with Francis Drake, Edward Swarthy, the porter of a, to a man called Sir Edward Winter living in Gloucestershire, who in 1596 uh, is ordered by his master to whip a much higher class, uh, higher status servant in the household. Uh, so that's a, um, a, a black Tudor whipping a white man who goes on to be a future coloniser in Newfoundland. Uh, uh, who next? A uh, reasonable black man, the silk weaver in Southwark in the 1590s. Um, Mary Phyllis, a woman from Morocco who gets baptised in uh, Elizabethan London. Um, uh, 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 Dedery Jakawa, a prince from River Sestos, which is modern-day Liberia. John Anthony, um, a sailor from Dover who sails, tries to sail to... The ship's meant to be going to Virginia, but only gets as far as Bermuda in 1619. And he's a waged sailor on the Silver Falcon, and that's significant partly because that's the year that the first enslaved Africans are sold into Virginia. 
So it's interesting contrast that there's a, a, a black man on an English ship being paid wages that same year. Um, then Anne Cobby, a tawny Moor, who was uh, a prostitute in 1620s Westminster, who uh, was paid uh, more money than other women because she had such soft skin. Um, although that was quite an anomaly, I didn't find any, hardly any other evidence of African women being prostitutes in this period, even though that's a kind of assumption that's made, particularly by Shakespeare scholars talking about dark ladies. Um, and finally, my far last chapter was on Catalina of Armandsbury, and she was a, described as a single woman. Uh, she was an independent woman living in Armandsbury in Gloucestershire, dying in 1625 and leaving an inventory of her goods at death, which shows that she was owning property, uh, not being property. And uh, her most valuable um, possession was a cow, which was worth three pounds and ten shillings. Anyway, so I think through those lives, I've been trying to communicate to a, a wider audience some of the conclusions I reached in my thesis about how Africans got here, what, how, what their lives were like, and, and the fact that they weren't enslaved. Um, other activities in, in it that I've been involved in are, um, in 2014, uh, Michael Ahjuru and I uh, set up a series called What's Happening in Black British History at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. Um, and we've had eight events since 2014. Uh, we do it twice a year, once in London and once somewhere outside London. So we've done Liverpool, Bristol, Preston, uh, Huddersfield. Uh, you know, let us know if you want to come, us to come to your town. Uh, and uh, that, um, I, uh, that we, we, ha you know, we have sort of three or four panels each time um, with uh, people presenting all sorts of different um, time periods and angles on black British history. And we're very much uh, trying to uh, encourage conversations. It's not just academic historians. It's very much about encouraging conversations between academic historians, independent historians, and everyone else with a stake in the world of history. So curate muse museum curators, archivists, um, public historians, uh, individual members of the public, school teachers, uh, students, um, you know, anyone. We want, we want every, you know, policymakers, it says on the website, but I'm not sure any policymakers have ever attended. But, um, you know, we really want to kind of create, oh, and we have a lot of creatives. Uh, in our last uh, thing, we had a wonderful session on Black British history in the theatre, and we had a uh, testament who's written Black Men Walking, about a black men's walking group in Sheffield, which somehow managed to traverse a thousand years of black British history in Yorkshire. Uh, there was a ballet about the Windrush that was put on recently. We had the artistic director of that coming to speak to us. So we're really trying to co cover all the bases. But I mean, I think it's also um, reflective, perhaps, of the fact that not a lot of this work is actually happening within the academy. And some of the most important speakers and most interesting speakers who have attended our events are from outside the academy. Uh, a lot of black British history work is happening, is being done by uh, independent historians and quite possibly people who it's not their main job at all and they're doing it in their spare time out of love of it. Uh, so that's you know an important issue that that has kind of uh, stumbled across, I think. Uh, and we have a website. Anyway, I'm going to tell you a bit more about that a bit later. And the new the new project that I'm involved in is called Colonial Countryside. And that's been set up by Corinne Fowler at the University of Leicester uh, from the uh, Centre for New Writing there. And it's in conjunction with People Tree Press and has been funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. Oh, no, not the Heritage Lottery Fund. The Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Arts Council. And um, there's been a national competition to find 10 creative writers to be involved with the project, which is working with 10 national trust houses nationwide and also with 10-year-old uh, school children. So each property is going to be working with a local primary school and one of the writers, and they're going to visit the houses and learn about those houses' links to Caribbean slavery and the East India Company, uh, and then write creatively and, and uh, write, write essays. The children can write essays as well, um, inspired by those histories, and there's going to be an annual children's conference, and there's going to be four books published in the th year three of the project, uh, which we're going to hope to bring to a wider audience. So that's working with school children and kind of public history more generally. So I'm quite excited to be part of that. Um, so 
that's what I'm up to. Um, how much time have oh, I got left? Okay, so reflections on historical research, power and diversity. You know, it's easy to cover in five minutes. Uh, so here I am sitting here. I'm very aware of my intersectional, to use your buzz, buzzword, but I think it, means, it still means something, intersectional white and class privilege in my case. I went to private school, I went to Oxford, um, you know, and I've, I've written in my notes, am I a beneficiary of implicit bias? Probably, but I think I would strengthen that to say I'm clearly a beneficiary of all these things and implicit bias quite probably. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly moving in sort of black history circles, I, I sometimes feel like white people in institutions are happier to talk to me because I'm somehow the kind of friendly face mm. of black British history, um, which is quite uncomfortable, but I'll talk a little bit in a second about how I've tried to respond to that. Um, I've said here the problem of diversity in history. So I think everyone else has touched on a lot of this, so I'll speed through it, but... It was just in the news the other week about Oxford and Cambridge, which obviously, being an alumna of Oxford, struck home with me particularly. Uh, some you know, these latest statistics that have come out of a Freedom of Information Act that uh, some Cambridge colleges admitted no black British students, or as few as one a year, between 2012 and 2016. Uh, between 2015 and 2017, one in four Oxford colleges had failed to admit a single black British student. So that's not a pretty picture. And I, I've been aware... That's across all disciplines, isn't it? I think so, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. not just history, mm -hmm. yeah. I've been aware uh, of this problem for some time, particularly as in uh, back in 2014, I think... No, in 2015, um, Hakima D, who's already been mentioned, uh, started an initiative called History Matters, mm -hmm. uh, inspired by some disturbing facts that were reported in 2014, which were... During 2012 to 13, there were only 1,340 black undergraduates studying history nationwide. I think you've, you've, that's 1.8, which is the stat you quoted, I think, as well, or similar. Uh, but it's not just the university. You know, 24, only three black students were admitted to train as history teachers in 2014. Uh, and 2015, it was estimated that there are less than 10 black PhD students studying history in this country. And of course, Hakeem is the only black history black history professor in the whole country. Mm. So <laughs> something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Mm. You know, it's at every educational level. It starts in primary school and it goes all the way through uh, the history uh, system. Um, so I think to get more professors, we actually need to start with 10-year-olds, mm. at least, maybe five-year-olds, maybe, th maybe three-year-olds. But you know, I think we need to get, start early and get people interested in history. Uh, from a really early age, um, uh, and that's you know that's something that I'm really pleased the Colonial Countryside Project is engaging with, working with ten-year-olds, and I've met some of these ten-year-olds, and they're really engaged and have a lot of interesting questions and things to say about the history. So I hope my work um, will attract more young black students to study history. Um, one of the things you were saying earlier was that it's about seeing yourself in the curriculum, but also you know, the disturbing amount of when you do have black history in the curriculum, it's all about slavery. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, pretty off-putting, I think. I mean, nobody, you know, if the only people you're seeing who look like you in your textbooks are naked and in chains, you know, that's not something that you're necessarily going to be wanting to pursue in your, in your studies. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, with black Tudors, with my research into Africans in early modern England, um, I think showing that those people weren't enslaved, that they were living lives, that they were skilled and paid for those skills and had quite amazing life stories uh, in this early modern world where slavery existed. The Spanish and Portuguese were enslaving people. About 300,000 Africans were brought, taken across the Atlantic between uh, 15, uh, early 1500s and 1619. So it's already happening, but it's happening in the Iberian world. Um, but it's, it's a quite a lot of the Africans who came to England was it was kind of a byproduct of that in that it was things like uh, when Spanish and Portuguese merchants came to London more often, uh, you know, with Africans in their households or you know Spanish and Spanish, particularly Spanish monarchs. So Catherine of Aragon and Philip II both married into the Tudor royal family and brought African servants with them. But a lot of the larger numbers, I think, came um, with privateering. So people like Francis Drake capturing 
uh, Spanish and Portuguese ships on the high seas or raiding Spanish ports in the Caribbean and actually capturing Africans and bringing them back to England, where their status was was governed by the fact that there was no slavery under the common law of England. And so, the, yeah, these individuals had agency. Um, Diego, the African who sails with Francis Drake, uh, you know, Take, you know, runs, he's enslaved in Panama and he runs away from his masters, his Spanish masters, and insists on getting on one of Drake's ships, even though they're shooting at him. He runs through the, the gunfire and insists on being taken aboard and actually manipulates the situation by telling Drake and his men that uh, there are loads of soldiers in town when there actually aren't, but he's kind of manipulating the situation to get himself on board. So I think these characters hopefully will, you know, engage young minds more because they're people they're not objects you know they're they're not victims they're doing things they have agency uh and you know in a small way my work hopefully helped to decolonize the subject by incorporating black history into you know the tudor curriculum which thus far has been hideously white and actually in david olashoga's book um he starts by talking about enoch powell and when Enoch Powell, in his flights of rhetoric, what he, he's saying, oh, it's the end of empire now, we need to think about who we are as English people, and to do that, we need to go back before the empire began. Let's think about the glorious Elizabethans. They were all white and great people, you know, and actually, they weren't. So I hope that I can, in a small way, you know, poke Enoch Powell in, <laughs> in the ribs. Uh, so, um, yeah, but, so, and also, you know, through publishing a, a trade book and doing the What's Happening Black British History initiative, I'm hoping that this work will reach a wider public and challenge preconceptions. But, I mean, that, I, it's not just a vague hope. Um, I was listening to Rennie Edo Lodge's podcast about race recently, and she had a really interesting discussion where she was saying she was sick of white people. Come, her book is called Why I'm No Longer Talking About to White People About Race. And she's like, I'm sick of white people coming up to me and saying, what can I do? And she's like, well, I don't know what you can do because I don't know who you are. I don't know what your position of influence are in the world. I've got absolutely no idea what you can do. Go and think about it for yourself, please. Uh, so that's what I've tried to do. Um, uh, so I've got, I've got lots of ideas. <laughs> I've got... Um, uh, well, it's more specific, well, an easy one to quickly say. So there's an organisation called Target Oxbridge that was set up by some black Oxford alumni, uh, and I'm going to be working with them that, this summer. I think they, deal, they work with about 160 students each summer, uh, and they have you know, a conference, but also kind of smaller seminar sessions with about 10 students and a historian such as me. So I'm going to be uh, talking to some of those students this summer, which I'm really excited about. Um, I uh, am in the process of applying for funding, probably through the University of Lancaster, uh, to get all the Black Tudors, my Black Tudors database online and a searchable website, which could feed into local history on the curriculum. A lot of the, um, you know, the primary and secondary curriculum wants a local study. So if they can find just one African baptised in their parish, then they can do the whole Black, Black Tudors history through that. Uh, and... Um, that funding application is going to include two funded, P funded PhD students uh, to, in the field of early modern black British history. Um, and uh, I also been thinking about how to reach primary and secondary schools. My, uh, my sister is actually a primary school teacher and we've been brainstorming this together. And we, uh, the problem with primary schools is that um, they don't have a lot of history time in their curriculum at all. And what they're really obsessed with is literacy mathematics and science so our way in is the literacy so uh my augusta and i and my sister i um have this idea to um create a kind of reader like a textbook but it would have extracts from books that are either non-fiction or fiction aimed at children there's quite a lot of literature with black characters in it there's quite a lot of children's versions of like the life of Equiano, for example, something like that. Have extracts from that and then have like comprehension questions of the sort that they do in primary schools and Augusta knows all about that. And she said she also could be able to use sort of like uh, these extracts to do more kind of grammar, well like understanding forms of writing. So the children need to learn what makes a diary entry a diary entry. So first person, past tense, 
uh, I think she said exciting adjectives, so I don't know about that. <laughs> My diaries are definitely full of exciting adjectives. But, um, uh, so, so then we could do that as well using the same kind of source material. Because some, some of the texts that these children use to learn how to read are so anodyne and incredibly dull, and why would they want to learn to read at all? So hopefully <laughs> we'll get some more exciting stuff in there. And in terms of secondary schools... Uh, I was at the Historical Association conference a couple of weeks ago, which is mostly teachers and mostly secondary teachers, I think, and I have this plan to do a workshop with, with them, supported by the Historical Association, the Schools History Project, possibly the RHS, and possibly my own institution. Uh, it's about, you know, as usual, getting a space, getting some funding for travel expenses and that sort of thing, but I want to workshop black tutors, and some of these teachers I met have already created teaching resources, written lessons based on back to so I want to capitalise on that. I tweeted about it two weeks ago and I got over 20 responses straight away from teachers who wanted to get involved, so I want to workshop that. And if that works, it can be a model to do more with different subjects, uh, so we're going to ask the teachers what subjects they need, diversifying, and then make it happen, she says very optimistically. If anyone wants to help, let me know. Uh, finally, in terms of active measures, What's happening in Black British history has an embryonic direct directory of Black British his history experts. And this bridges academia and the world wider world. It would allow academics to see who else is doing what and can they collaborate on stuff. Uh, but, but in terms of public education, me people from the mu museum's world, from heritage world, from the media could find experts. You know, there's all this chat about how you know radio 4 calls up the same three white guys whenever they want to comment on anything uh but if they have a di access to a directory of black british history experts hopefully they could diversify who's on the radio and also come up with ideas for um for documentaries opinion pieces etc and i was talking to someone from radio 3 about this recently um yeah, so those, those are active messages. And I just finally want to say a little bit about using my own privilege. Um, I'm in quite a good position now, amazingly. Uh, and, you know, because, well, I didn't, anyway, I didn't expect to be in this position. But anyway, um, so I think, you know, I've, I've, again, been thinking a lot about passing the mic and sharing platforms, um, because quite often people ask me to do things, and I'm not the best person for the job, but for some reason they've heard of me, but they haven't heard of the people that they ought to have heard of. And, uh, you know, for example, I recently got contacted by an, a, um, an editor at the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, and they're quite good. They have been consistently trying to inc include more black and Asian lives in the dictionary for quite some time now, but he wanted to consult me about uh, including more in for the next round of editions. And... Um, I you know, immediately kind of circulated the request to the Black and Asian Studies Association mailing list, the, uh, the Black British Studies mailing list, you know, and, and individually to particular historians I knew, uh, trying, you know, trying to broaden out that question. It's not just me. I don't, you know, I don't know very much about whole swathes of Black British history. So uh, I managed to source suggestions from a wider pool. But also he then asked me to write myself like three of these entries. Uh, <laughs> And I was able to pass on two of them to two different historians of colour. So I'm pleased about that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now this this um, sorry. And also I've said I've already said that the What's Happening in Black British History series, you know, is very much showcasing the work of Black British historians, also historians of Black British history, which is not always the same thing. And why should Black historians study Black history? You know, they should be able to study whatever they want and vice versa. So, but we're getting Black British history out there more. And finally, just this kind of rather painful example of the problem. I, I'm afraid I'm entering on a negative note, but I've had so much positivity in the last five minutes. So, uh, on the 22nd of February 2016, I received this email from a producer of the Radio 4 series Making History, who will remain nameless. Uh, Dear Miranda, on Friday, uh, at our studios in Brighton, we will be recording a programme in which we ask the question, where are all the black historians? However, I'm finding it very hard to find anyone of colour to be a guest on this programme. So, number one. Do you know any black historians, brackets, preferably women? <laughs> Two, if not, then would you consider joining us? 
Uh, so, dear Nick, have a look at our developing directory at blackbritishhistory.co.uk. These people might fit your bill with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fourteen suggestions of historians of colour that they could contact. That's probably enough to be going on with. Let me know if you need further suggestions or if I can be in help of any other way. Uh, I look forward to listening to the programme and would be happy to appear on any of your programmes myself if and when it, you know, it would be fitting, unlike this programme. So, long email, very helpful. Reply. Thanks, Miranda. End of correspondence. So, uh, and you know, if you look online, Patrick Vernon, uh, who is a community historian, uh, wrote a really good blog commenting on the programme in which... Uh, I think they eventually got Hakima D and Olivette Atelli, and they had about six minutes to discuss the much larger problem of where are all the black historians. And uh, unfortunately, I think there were quite a lot of white guests in the studio as well, and they actually got the white people to discuss it for quite a, for quite a lot of that time as well. So it was a bit, it wasn't a very pleasing program. But anyway, uh, that's me. That's what I'm doing. Uh, if anyone wants to help, let me know. And uh, yeah, so I hope I've suggested some positive ways forward. So thank you very much. Okay, wonderful contributions. Thank you very much. Um, we have a roving mic. Um, I might need someone to rove with it, um, but could you raise your hand if you have a question and I'll uh, okay. attempt yeah. to move around the audience. We've got one there. We've got, I'm just getting a sense of who wants to ask them. One here. Actually, could we start here since you're right? The, 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 I was going to say the lady in red. But. Okay. Hi. Does this work? Uh, if not, I can shout. You can hear me? Yeah. Thank you very much for your contributions and for the insight into your experience, especially for the three panelists whose experiences I wouldn't otherwise know because the university where I went to didn't have any academics of color. So, um, I'm unfortunately going to go a little bit negative. I'm sorry, you ended on a positive note, but I, had, I have to go there. Um, because the situation is really dire. And I wonder if there's any point in trying with the way that the institutions are the way that they are right now. I personally, um, I, I, I have as a personal example encountering um, Black History Walks, which is a London-based organization that is run entirely by black people, and they put on lectures, and they put on talks, and they have their own seminar series. And I went along, um, I went and did a Black History Walk and learned stuff. Uh, me and my wife were the only white people on the, t on the tour, you will be no doubt shocked to hear, mm -hmm. and learned stuff about London history that I would not have encountered otherwise um, and subsequently have gone on to other things and when uh, Black Panther came out they had two special screenings with none like nobody who spoke was white it was only black academics and I learned stuff that I would never have encountered otherwise and went out of my way to go and see that because I knew that's where I could find out about this stuff and didn't trust that I would be able to access it anywhere else because that's the flip side of it is I don't know where to go to find the non-negative stuff, the positive stories about African history and to find out about like why it was important that the children buried the king at those points because that was part of the cultural stuff that I don't even know that I don't know. Um, so when there's initiatives like that that have completely not just decolonize the institution, but have left the institution entirely and have that freedom. Mm. <sighs> Do you know? Mm. I mean, we have to start with three-year-olds. Mm. This is already happening. Okay, let, really, let me put that to the panel. I guess the question, yeah. the, the, just to wrap it up and turn it into mm. a question, mm. wouldn't it be better for us to be supporting those mm -hmm. initiatives? Good question. <laughs> um, I think, okay, I have, I have like many answers to that. 
Okay, so um, first, yeah, I do think that we should be supporting those institutions because there's a reason why there are so many of these community-engaged histories, like the Black Cultural Archives, like um, um, there's an oral history network as well. So yes, instead of thinking that we need to create them, because the thing is there's still supplementary schools and so many people in black community already supplementing the curriculum. Um, but also, well, quite frankly, we shouldn't have to go out. Like, I shouldn't have to. So, so many students of colour shouldn't have to go outside of the university that they pay nine grand to go to, to study history that they would want to study. Um, and also, I applaud the efforts of academics who have set up courses like Black Studies and the Race and Resistance Masters, because that is creating spaces to study a more, um, I was going to say a diverse history, but I, I just argued against that for like <laughs> 20 minutes, but you get what I mean. Um, so, <laughs> a lot of things here, right? So, of course, this, this history, um, the diversity of black history exists, right? Di black history is a very diverse history. And the thing is that um, black communities learn it, we learn it, right? In the same ways that, you know, any other community can learn that history. Um, I think the issue is that those, um, community projects, let's say, those community histories are separated from the institution. But it's, it's academia that gets, like we are the experts. When you have doctor in front of your name and you work at a, at a university, right, you become the expert on that history. You're the ones that the BBC will contact for your, you know, for your expertise or whoever will contact for your expertise. And so, um, and so you then become the voice of that history. And I think that's part of the problem, is that the, the academia then gets it's separate, separate in a lot of ways from this, this community-based history. And really what it should be doing is engaging with that history. And so, um, and then when academia is dominated by, um, when there's a lack of, of black historians, for instance. And actually, I want to challenge this idea that there aren't potential um, uh, black historians, right? Because I, I know quite a few black people, UK-based black historians in this country with PhDs who are not hired by the institution, right? Mm -hmm. And like Warwick, Oxford mm -hmm. is not representative of Warwick. We actually um, have, we are representative, our BME uh, student population is actually representative of the population. It's actually increased mm -hmm. quite significantly in this last year. So there are BME students. Mm -hmm. Admission is not our issue, mm -hmm. right, is what mm -hmm. I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. Black people, uh, people of color are interested in history, <laughs> right? And, and we're familiar with history, but I think that there's just this divide and one, one area gets credited and gets acknowledged as being experts and the others don't, right? And so those who get, um, well, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I only add to, slightly to this. Um, there's power in these institutions, cultural, social, economic, um, and it's important that it, that is shared more widely amongst, amongst the populace that the place becomes more democratic and representative as a result of that. But also, history, it's, it's bad across the sector, but history's worse than a lot of other disciplines. Um, and so, there are, there are things that can be done that are being done in other disciplines that would improve your situation. Mm. Wouldn't rectify mm. it entirely, but would certainly improve it. H history has a problem mm. which is worse than other disciplines, and we need mm. to recognise that. Um, yeah, I, I know about Black History Walks. Um, Tony Warner, who set it up, has spoken at What's Happening Black British History, uh, and so have other community projects, uh, including Narrative Eye and Kirtley's Local TV in Huddersfield. Uh, so in, in some sense, you know, our, we, our initiative is, is supporting some of those voices. But, you know, like I said, I think they're all examples of how, you know, how a lot of the good work being done on this history is happening outside of the academy. We need to build some ebony towers. Um, uh, but I, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Cheesy. Um, but um, I, think, I think the Black Cultural Archives... Uh, is actually a really interesting example because it started out very much as a community history 
project and it has now gained institutional status. And I heard a really good paper from Paul Reed, the director, about that history over the last sort of 30 years more. Uh, and it really did start out as a grassroots kind of community organisation. And But he was saying, you know, now they are an institution. Now it says archives. Now they have a building, which is an archive storage, which is like... I can't remember, it was some like whole letters of numbers, meaning that it's like top of the range archival accommodation for documents. Uh, you know, other institutions are now speaking to them and, and reacting to them in a completely different way, and they're able to interact and engage with the more uh, established institutions that we all know and love. Uh, <laughs> so, on a, as equals, instead of, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of there are quite a lot of examples where academics have attempted to work with communities quite often but sometimes i mean cynically to say because some funding institutions want that in their funding bids it's uh, you know you are more likely to get funding if you're able to demonstrate that your work collaborating outside the academy with a local community uh, but i've heard a lot of people from those communities complaining that the one, the minute the checks arrived you, they get discarded which is a really unfortunate negative um, negative outcome of something that was meant to be positive from the funding institutions. But like I said, so those communities have less power in that situation, but, it, but the Black Cultural Archive, now that they are an institution, have a lot more power in those discussions and they are beginning to do joint initiatives with other institutions and that's a really positive example, I think. Okay, I know there was a question there and there's one there as well. So. Thank you very much. Shall I start? Oh, are we just going here? Oh, have you got a mic already? Yeah. Oh, well, I think I... Okay, go on then. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, okay, thanks very much. And mm. I wanted to make a couple of points. Um, one is that I've been involved in setting up a new children's history society with my colleague over there. And, um, I mean, part of our mission is to get more children's history into the curriculum, which absolutely should be hand in hand with more black history. Mm. And um, the second point is I think um, it would be good to look outside both prestigious institutions and history departments. So I teach at the University of Greenwich in the Department of Education and Community Studies, and we now have compulsory history of childhood and youth and history of education in our first year. So in that course um, and my other courses, I've done my best to develop a global multicultural for all its faults perspective. Um, I think what's frustrating is students who want to do history of childhood and history degree are not going to come and do childhood and youth studies at Greenwich um, unless we get a really good reputation. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's important to think that, you know, and the other point is that the majority of my students are black. Um, you know, it's very different when you start looking at the former polytechnics. And I think there should be analysis of what's mm -hmm. going on there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying, I mean, I'm not saying what our university, our university does have an initiative to um, decolonise the curriculum. I, I do think they've got a long way to go. But I just think there should be more awareness of what's happening across the field. Okay. Any response to that? Or we treat that as a comment? Or? Well, I, I, just to note that the statistics which were put up there are uh, HESA document uh, statistics, which come from the Equality Challenge mm -hmm. Unit. Is that right? So that is for the sector as a whole. Yeah, um, yeah. There, so there, there is a problem which is across the sector. Student intake does differ dramatically between uh, Russell Group and uh, post 92 universities and London-based um, well. London ones. Yeah. Uh, and so there are very different experiences in classrooms which go on there, but faculties remain predominantly white across those institutions. Yeah, um, yeah I'm not disputing that for a minute. Yeah. But I, I also think, you know, should be thinking about things like children's history and also how that can engage students mm -hmm. because, you know, a lot of the students we teach will put off history at school, as you've said yourselves. But, and, um, you know, there are ways in which they could be more engaged. And, and people okay. working in history departments don't necessarily see that because they see people who've actually chosen to do history. Mm. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, coming to you now. Uh, hello. Um, I have a question. Um, a couple of you kind of touched on this um, during the opening comments, but um, I wanted to raise a question about how um, in teaching black history and black British history, um, there tends to be uh, a real overemphasis, as you pointed out, on suffering and specifically slavery and histories of trauma in that way. 
um, which isn't necessarily reflective of the broader trends uh, in research in black history, which tends to be much more about highlighting agency. And so I wanted to hear uh, your kind of reflections on, on that side of teaching and how we balance that against the um, kind of pernicious opposite tendency to suggest that kind of racism only really existed in Britain in this very sort of short period in the 19th century. Um, or, you know, that there was no racism before a certain point and um, that, you know, po post-1948 or whatever, um, Britain's got this kind of history of progressive uh, uh, tolerance um, of diversity. Um, and the second point, which sort of leads into my second point, um, uh, or, or question rather, about um, how black British history is, or black history rather, is seen as a, a kind of specialist subject and to what extent that um, prevents it from being, if you like, integrated into survey courses um, and, and ad actually that um, black history is not a kind of special interest subject. Mm -hmm. it's, it's simply part of a, of a much uh, larger um, um, history that's, that's of interest to everyone, not just those with this mm -hmm. specialist kind of interest, if you, if, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. Yeah. Comment on that, Did you want to? Uh, well, I can comment on the second point, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, with, with the what's happening in black British history, we very much, I mean, yeah, saying black British history is trying to incorporate, I mean, it's very much, you know, my whole, uh, it's trying to incorporate black history into the mainstream, but even calling it black British history is still slightly problematic, and it should just be British history. But, I mean, on the other hand, you have got to focus on something when you're, you know, giving the title of something, you have to give some indication of what's actually going to be covered. But yeah, I, I very strongly agree that those histories we're talking about are part and parcel of the weft and warp of British history. And in fact, trying to tell the story of British history without including some of these stories is actually not telling the full story. Martin Spafford, an excellent uh, retired secondary school teacher, talks about teaching a full color history, uh, which is a phrase I quite liked. Um, and I think uh, in terms of injecting it into the, the curriculum, yeah, because I think it's uh, another sort of part of this trend is the whole Black History Month thing in October, which again kind of separates it off and kind of ghettoizes black history as like it's something separate that you do once a year and you tick off, you tick your box that you've done it and then you don't bother with it the rest of the year. And Black Cultural Archives talks about Black History 365. But um, I think. Uh, when I've been talking to these secondary school teachers about black Tudors, you know, most most teachers, most schools teach the Tudors, uh, and they've been talking about doing these. Um, and again, it's not perfect, but like they, apparently in York they do this thing called like a inset or an insert or something, you know, where they can we can if we write a kind of black Tudors lesson or two lessons, they can then just insert it into their current Tudor curriculum. And again, I mean, it's not perfect. It'll be like you said, they do kind of one week on race, one week on gender. You know, it's not perfect, but if it's there, then that can maybe inform the rest of the course, you know, because they'll know about it, so they, it might inform the rest of the discussion. And I think um, it can be incorporated into uh, other stories. So, you know, Drake features in the book might they'll probably learn about Francis Drake at some point. You know, it, it can be included. You know, John Blank is Henry VIII's trumpeter. It can be included. Um, and actually, with the Colonial Countryside Project, um, I've been visiting Buckland Abbey, which is a National Trust house near Plymouth, which Francis Drake bought with some of his ill-gotten gains from these Caribbean raids. So there, and we're actually in talks there to, to include the story of Diego in their presentation there. So... It, it is possible to incorporate this stuff into the wider public British history, I think, if we, if we try. OK, I can see there's a question there, and there's one there. Ah. Yes. Okay, I've got a response to this uh, question as well. Oh, apologies. Yes, quickly. didn't realise. Um, which is, which is yes. just to say that I should have said this at the start. I'm not a historian of uh, British history mm -hmm. at all. I, I'm a historian of animal history of Burma. Um, <laughs> but I am neither Burmese nor a non-human animal. Um, so it's important to disentangle That's that good. a little bit. The, nonetheless, at other institutions, 
I have been given black British history, late 20th century black British history, dissertations to supervise mm -hmm. in a department where there are yeah. British, modern British historians. Mm -hmm. well, the assumption going on there is, it was mm. I was on a temporary contract at the time. It was too obvious to count, call out, really. <laughs> and maybe I should have, but I, I didn't. But all that said, not wanting to have too much of an association between how someone's race is read and the subject they want to study, it is clear from a lot of the student surveys on why uh, decolonizing the curriculum, why is my curriculum white, that having these types of courses marked out distinctively as core parts of a curriculum does encourage participation mm -hmm. and recruitment from from a wider student body. Mm -hmm. So on that basis alone, I think it's it's worth having. I know that doesn't address your first question about the type of history which is then taught, but I, th I think most people teach quite sophisticated histories. I think when it gets to the undergraduate level, that doesn't hopefully it doesn't fall down on that mm -hmm. dichotomous mm -hmm. victims slash agency. Sure. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, I mean, one of the issues here is the, the scale of the problem is so great that you can do lots of bits of things, but it actually needs institutional uh, driving of the change to make any effect. I mean, I live in New Zealand, and we have a similar problem there. The figures aren't quite as negative, but um, for Maori and Pacific staff, we had exactly the same problem. And um, the deans and the academics always said, well, look, firstly, there aren't the jobs that um, Maori and Pacific want because they don't do the right disciplines, mm -hmm. but even if there were the jobs, there aren't the qualified Maori and Pacific. So our vice chancellor decided, uh, he's an unusual man, to t take this thesis on, hypothesis on. So he said, okay, he said, you're always saying there's more, uh, that we don't have enough staff, so I'll fund eight jobs. And they're for Maori and Pacific, and they're particularly for early career people who've just got PhDs. So let's advertise the eight jobs. It was amazing how quickly the deans managed to find eight jobs that people could apply for. What was more amazing was just the sheer number of people well, qualified people, recently qualified people, who came in. So in the first year, we appointed eight, and since then, we've appointed eight uh, every year. So that's 24 early career Maori and Pacific. Now, it, it doesn't solve the problem, but what also happened was we discovered some of the problems around our recruitment processes. Mm. Uh, there was a mythology that had emerged that was influencing both the way we advertised and the way we actually um, interviewed. So there's some problems around it. It hasn't quite worked as we wanted it to. But it actually needed, at the top level, uh, people to say, look, this is something you can all do something about, but actually an institution has to do something about it. Mm -hmm. I, do, uh, I haven't got a question about that, unless people know of similar initiatives in the UK, because, as I say, that's one component of a, a major change program. Okay. One thing I think which does come out of that is, is thinking about the types of contracts that people are on. Now, I don't have the data for history specifically, but for the sector as a whole, um, BME, his, BME academics are overrepresented on temporary contracts. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you were wanting to get something which would be beneficial for all academics, but would be especially beneficial for BME academics, it would be policing the use of temporary contracts. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would say that there, I mean, the recruitment process is absolutely something that needs to be further investigated. I mean, I think it's, it's part of the problem, really. Mm -hmm. Um, that claim that there aren't any BME uh, historians in the, in, in the country, I mean, it's, it's, it's ludicrous. And I think what happens is that they get cut off at, at long listing or short listing because of a, a variety of different issues. It's amazing how, um, it's shocking and sad how quickly and easily that happens, right? And then there's these claims about uh, the, the lack of historians. I think what we need to do is actually start looking at the data for applications, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, and I mean, I don't think it's any one thing. I think you have to have both. Uh, you know, using the example of the of the secondary curriculum, um, you know, Gove rewrote everything a couple of years ago, and you know, likely the government's too busy with Brexit to think about changing the the curriculum again anytime soon. Uh, but we need to still keep pressurising for general curriculum change. But it's not going to happen overnight. So in the meantime. Uh, you know, smaller initiatives, you know, are worth pursuing. If, you know, every history teacher that you can reach, you're changing, you know, a cl one classroom at a time. And it's better than nothing. It's not perfect, but it's something. And then by the time, you know, if we have, if there, by the time the next consultation about a new curriculum comes around, we'll have a lot to show for ourselves when we're making that argument. Uh, yeah, so I think 
you know, and it's the same what you were saying about community historians versus. I think I think it's about supporting all of these things and trying to get at it from every which way, bottom up, top down, sideways, you know, anything. Just keep going is is my feeling. Do I see any more questions there? Yes, person in the middle there. Oh, yep. Yeah. It's going. Just put your hand up again. There we are. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask if there's um, anything kind of super practical that people can do within departments, um, because uh, the reason I'm asking is because in my experience it's been incredibly frustrating um, across different institutions where I've had uh, conversations about uh, department makeup, around um, race, but also more personally around uh, kind of... Uh, out queer people um, and it's difficult because you either get this kind of why you bothered approach from a minority of people or it ends up being conversations that are really selective within um, equality and diversity committees and so on so everybody there cares but the message isn't necessarily getting outside of that committee um, and from my personal perspective as a PhD student, there's not necessarily a lot of power that I have to persuade people in the academy in my department to care about these things. And it's just kind of left me feeling really frustrated by saying it over and over again and the message not really going anywhere and kind of left me at a point of, well, what else do I do? What else can I do, etc. cetera. Okay. So, I mean, institutions are going to have to care soon, right, especially with the introduction of um, uh, department level TEF, mm. right, and I think it's mm. actually going to have an incredible impact on things like this. As a matter of fact, my post is a result mm. of TEF, right, it's a, it's a result of mm. um, the university mm. caring, uh, or not that they didn't care before, but really taking a keen interest in student experience quite broadly. And so I think more and more uh, universities and departments are going to have to sort of reckon with this in some level, right? Um, in terms of the practical things, I mean, um, like we've talked a lot about sort of, again, about like sort of, uh, it's not just the content of these things, right, but also just the discussion about race and racism, right, which is, it doesn't matter what you teach, right, but um, I mean, in the same ways that we would talk about uh, sexism in, the, in, in our departments and things like that, I think having those kinds of com uh, conversations and bu building some kind of critical mass are quite, is quite important, I think. Um, if there, you do have colleagues of color in your department, making sure that they are not the they are not the they are not the ones doing all the diversity work, right? <laughs> mm. Make sure that you are the one mm. who is speaking up and, and things mm. like that. I think those kinds of things are really um, important. Um, yeah, but in terms of making people care, again, like <laughs> like when your number, like when I think it's it, it is those kinds of the overseeing bodies that are are going to matter. Mm. What's the, the new office of students? Mm. Um, is that, that's, that, that's, what that's what it's now called, isn't it? The Office of Students, right? They're now bringing in different kinds of measures mm. as well, specifically around attainment, mm. right? So I think that the university is going to be pushed uh, in these areas. Yeah, I'd also say um, learn how your institution works, the, yeah. the, the forums okay. for pushing things forward there, and work as collectively as you can. Um, prepare for meetings in advance, a few of you, so that you know who's going to make what points. Just, just treat, treat the university as a, as, as a place where you need to take adversarial democratic politics. That's what I do, as my yes. colleagues know to their own yes. um, <laughs> cost. Uh. Um, so can I follow this up yes. with another Go. question? Um, so my, uh, um, so I've just moved from being a MA student to being a PhD student. So one of the things that I've also been kind of thinking about here is a lot of like really good kind of uh, initiatives are coming from uh, like student unions and stuff, but mm. PhD students and mm. faculty don't really seem to engage with that or um, as well as they should. I didn't know if that's something or... Yeah, I was, I was just about to say that um, a lot of faculty, well, working with Melissa, I realized that a lot of students do a lot of their own work through societies and then the faculty within departments that do work and then there'll be PhD students. So really there needs to be more coalition across those spheres. 
um, yeah. So. And it's, it's amazing how much power students have, I think, within mm. a department. And so mm. for us at Warwick, um, working collaboratively with students has been incredibly powerful mm. in terms of pushing things forward. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Oh, sorry, one, one last thought of that. This is just something that occurred to me was, um, you know, the power of social media. I mean, these days, you know, if you get into a good enough fight with the right person, it becomes like, you know, th th page three news, you know. I, I, and the amount, of, the amount of articles I've read now that are basically just a summary of a Twitter story with quotes, you know, and, and like the, the screenshots. So I think that's definitely something everyone can do is, if, you know, if you're on Twitter or Instagram or any of these things, you know, look out for these kind of, you know, opportunities. And there's, there's plenty of opportunities to comment and retweet and circulate things amongst your, your network uh, to raise awareness and to question things. You know, like as jo Jonathan was saying, you know, the Nigel Bigger thing you know, did play out really strongly across Twitter. Um, and, and so, I th I, yeah, I think that's another medium we can use to protest, to collaborate, to organise. Yeah. Great. I'm going to begin to wrap this up because uh, we have other events going on, but I wanted to thank the panel for um, extraordinary contributions, and I'll ask you to thank them in the appropriate way in a second. Let me just say a couple of things about the Social History Society and how we can make a, some contribution to this work. Um, we've set up a diversity strand in this conference, so it would be interesting to hear your feedback, how that's gone, is that something that should continue or not? Um, we've set up this panel uh, to, to air these, these uh, discussions and uh, the committee is interested in establishing some kind of social history society, BME network run by and for historians of colour um, uh, and see where that goes and if that's something that flourishes, great, and if that's something that's thought not to be needed, equally great. So um, we'll be working on that over the next 12 months. Um, so let me invite you to thank the panel. I also want to thank a special thanks to Sue. I think being an undergraduate on this panel is pretty daunting. You did very well. Thank you.